Hello again from Daniel Mesa for my friends in Kenya. This is the second part to the courtship concept in the Bible, looking at the story of Abraham sending his servant for his only begotten son of promise, and that servant is preparing a bride for that young man, the only begotten son of promise in this case. So what we have is Genesis chapter 24. We're going to be looking at verse 29 and going right into this study. I've already prayed, asked God's blessings on our time together, and I'm sure that you have done that before the meeting that you have started as well. So let's get into what it is that the Bible is saying to us in regard to how we can get together with somebody for the rest of our lives on earth, and we can be blessed in doing so. Genesis 24, 29. Rebecca had a brother. His name was Laban, and Laban ran out unto the man, unto the well. So obviously, Rebecca wanted to get her family involved, as we had talked about before, and the family took it seriously. He didn't just relax on his way out to the well. The man, Laban, ran, it says, out to the well, and it came to pass when he saw the earring and the bracelets upon his sister's hand, and when he heard the words of Rebecca, his sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me, that he came unto the man. And behold, he stood by the camels at the well. Remember, the camels were part of the dowry. And this man is there waiting patiently. He was probably still praying, the servant that is. And the brother of Rebekah was very interested to make sure that her sister was being taken care of by this man at the well with the camels. And so he said, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord. Wherefore standest thou without? For I have prepared the house and room for the camels. Now, I want you to notice something, that the father's not really involved here, it's the brother. The brother is involved and goes and takes care of this situation because he is probably close in age to his sister, Rebecca, and there's a good chance that they know each other pretty well, and he's going to be able to say, you know what, that guy's for you, or no, it's not for you. But the father, of course, understands that as well. But it's possible, in many cases, that the father was out to work a lot and wasn't as home as much as the brother and sister growing together. So... In this case, we have the brother interacting with this man who is the servant of Lord Abraham. So, going over here now, the comment says, Rebecca was so excited that she told her brother as well about all things that had transpired. So, if you have family that desires the best for you, you should have them involved. They should be part of your experience coming together with somebody because they know you like nobody else does. Unless, of course, you have a broken up family, and I know that exists all around the world. So you need friends and family and people close to you, <clears throat> somebody who is a spiritual leader of some sort, that will be able to pray with you through this and find a way that will be encouraging for you and your spouse. So when a couple tries to keep something like a relationship with another secret, it is likely it's because there is a conviction that others will think that it's not the best idea, which means that it probably isn't the best idea, right? If one does not have godly parents, but uh, to give them instruction, then the best thing for them to do, as I said earlier, is to go and seek godly counselors like a Christian friend or a pastor. Someone should be able to see with you the providence of God, else it may not be as apparent as you think. You're emotions might be connected but your eyes might not be seeing quite as clear because you've got spirals going around in your head right so it's good to get an outside perspective on something like courtship because this will affect the rest of your life the rest of that other person's life and the rest of the families and friends that are involved right so we need to see how we need to understand how easy it is for somebody's emotions to get involved making it that much harder for the person's mind to be sound and balanced. Finally, of course, the brother saw the ability of this man to take care of his sister, heard the story, all of what had happened through God's providence, and he was convinced. So now the brother wants this man to come over to the house to meet the rest of the family, because it's important to get everybody involved, right? So as we continue in 32, it says, The man came unto the house. He ungirded his camels and gave them straw and provender, right? So the man was taking care of the camels that were brought. There was 10 of them, and so they were going to eat a lot. But we're not going to just neglect others who have come to our house. This man is giving a very good example, Laban. 
he's showing that you can take care of somebody's stuff when it's at your home, right? And of course he brought water to wash his feet and the men's feet that were with him. So he wasn't alone. The servant actually had a crowd that was there to witness this experience. So it is clear in the previous verse that the man did not come into the house of the family until he was invited, right? He was, the camels were given food, the feet were washed, etc. And we should not force our ways either into a situation in another person's family, hoping that God will work out the details. No, 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 no. Patience is a very good virtue in this situation, in the forming of good Christian quality relationships. And I think we can take a little lesson from just that brief little comment about him waiting until he was invited in. Verse 33 says, There was set meat before him to eat, but he wasn't eating. He said, I will not eat until I have told my errand. So I am here to describe the providence of God. And so Laban said, speak on. The situation was so serious for the servant that he would not eat until he had relayed the message that was on his heart. He was so excited about the providence of God that he had already seen that he would rather speak about it than eat. And I think that's one of the ways we can be part of this scenario as well. So he said, I am Abraham's servant and the Lord hath blessed my master greatly and he has become great and he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses and you can see some of the man servants and the camels here with me right and Sarah my master's wife bare a son to my master when she was old and unto him hath he the master which is Abraham given all that he hath so now unto this son Isaac there is everything that the Ancient of Days has that has been given unto him. I think that's really important because what we can see in the bigger picture of this is that everything that God the Father has, he has given to the Son. He gave him life, he gave him power, he gave him the ability to live on this earth without sin, he's given him a throne. All things that the Son has have been of the Father. And in the same way here, Abraham this very wealthy person that had all these things, he was able to give everything that he had to his son as well. So again, another example of the one true God and his ministry, his gospel, that is saving you and me even right now while we're reading this story. So I think it's pretty interesting to see the bigger picture of the gospel in this microcosm story. So going back to verse 37, my master made me swear saying, thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell. And you're going to see that he goes through the whole history. Watch this. But thou shalt go unto my father's house, into my kindred, and take a wife unto my son. And I said unto my master, Peradventure the woman will not follow me. And he said unto me, The Lord, before whom I walk, will send an angel with thee, and prosper thy way. And thou shalt take a wife for my son and my kindred, and of my father's house. So staying here in verse 41, I just wanted to say that it's really interesting in this story because we're seeing the bigger picture of the gospel, right? We're seeing the Ancient of Days, the son, and the servant. What is the servant in this scenario? Well, the servant is the one that's going out to be directed by the angel of the Lord. And we are God's servants as well, that we will be directed by the angels of the Lord too. So I bring this up because in the third angel's message of Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 through 12, there are people mentioned. There are those that worship the beast and his image. So there's the beast and his image and those that worship, right? Well, there's also, of course, the spirit of Satan that is empowering them. So the beast, his image, those that worship, they're full of the spirit of Satan. But in the, the third angel's message, there's also God the Lamb, the holy angels, and those that worship as well. So the Spirit of God is within all those as well. So what we have here is this picture, this scenario where we have the agents of Satan being empowered and directed by his Spirit, whereas we have the agents of God, or the agency of the Spirit, if you will, and we're being directed by his Spirit as well. So what we're seeing in this microcosm picture is the Father, the Ancient of Days, the only begotten Son of Promise, which is the Son of God, 
we see the servant representing the ministration of the Holy Spirit and the angelic ministry as well that's here being referred to by this servant. So we can see that there's a co-working together with the agents of God to prepare that bride so she can be taken back to and directed toward the sun so they can finally meet and life will be eternal, right? So that's what's exciting about this story right here. Let's go back to the Bible in verse 41. Then shalt thou be clear from this my oath when thou comest to my kindred, and if they give not thee one, thou shalt be clear of mine oath. And I came this day unto the well and said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if now thou do prosper my way which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass that when the virgin cometh forth to draw water, and I say to her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water of thy pitcher to drink. And she say to me, Both drink thou, and I will also draw for thy camels. Let the same be the woman whom the Lord hath appointed out for my master's son. And before I had done speaking in mine heart, behold, Rebekah came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder, and she went down unto the well and drew water. And I said unto her, Let me drink, I pray thee. And she made haste and let down her pitcher from her shoulder and said, Drink, I will give thy camels drink also. So I drank and she made the camels drink also. And I asked her and said, Whose daughter art thou? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bare unto him. I put an earring upon her face, as mentioned earlier, and bracelets upon her hands, and I bowed down my head, and I worshipped the Lord, and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham, which had led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter unto his son. <laughs> so what you can see here is that the servant is really excited because he has been able to recount the entire process of how this providential experience started and he was able to relate to the family of this damsel all the things that he had seen and experienced he related it every single thing that had happened he didn't leave out anything he talked about all the details so that the family would know that there is like everything's laid out we're not hiding anything from anybody so that everybody can know for sure whether this is of god or whether it is not now, I was doing a wedding service. I've done lots of wedding services in the past as a pastor over in Michigan and different places in the United States here. And I've even held some in other places. There was one time where I kind of wondered if this couple was committing themselves to the Lord or if they were just not committing themselves to the Lord and were just wanting to be married for the sake of life being happy here on the earth. And so I told them, I said, you both could together, since you're holding hands today and making a covenant one to another for the rest of your lives, you can together go straight to heaven or you can go together straight to hell. And there was silence. And I, in fact, I even left a moment of silence after saying that just to kind of let it settle in. And they were both looking at me like with big eyes and the people in the audience were looking at me as well, like, whoa, I mean, do you, are you supposed to say those things at a wedding service? And the answer is yes, this should be a very serious activity in your life. This is not something that you're going to do again and again and again. Well, you shouldn't. Maybe some people do, but you shouldn't. This is a covenant that you're making under God, which represents the gospel. That's really, really what's a beautiful picture of marriage is it represents the Ancient of Days sending forth his only begotten son of promise with the servants and the angelic ministry joining hands with the only begotten son to co-work together to prepare this bride so that she will by the spirit of god be drawn to the son and they will have that unity that will be glorious in the eyes of all of heaven that's what this is supposed to be we don't want to mess that up and so the more we understand the gospel and what God has done in sending his son to prepare a bride, the more we will better know what it's like to be a husband, what it's like to be a bride, and what it means in the eyes of God. The Bible says God hates divorce. Why? Because it destroys the gospel. And that's why he hates divorce. 
God doesn't want his son to divorce the church on the earth. Unfortunately, that had to happen because, for example, Matthew chapter 23, toward the end, Jesus said unto the church that he was raised in and was sent to save. He said, your house is left unto you desolate. So in a sense, Christ had to divorce the church so that he could be together with the one that was the remnant of that church that claimed to be his, which of course, as we know, is blasphemy, according to Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 27, where those that claim to be Christian but don't really follow God, and they break his commandments, they are blasphemous. And so they were committing blasphemy, Christ called it out, and he continued on with the remnant of his people, and that's where he was able to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And so this whole scenario with not uh, divorcing is really for the purpose of the gospel, okay? It's bigger than just you and your spouse. This is a huge concept. And so I praise God that he has enabled me as his servant and my wife as his servant to be able to get to be together for now over 19 years. What an honor that is. And yes, it's been tough. It's not been roses and beautiful smells every day. I mean, it's, it's a really difficult situation to continue walking in love, being kind, being Christian. I mean, like I've heard somebody say that uh, we are justified individually. Every single one of us are justified alone by themselves. And I said, yeah, but we're sanctified together. God brings people into our lives so that we can be refined and ennobled, right? So that our characters can be adjusted. And I have a friend in the past that said one time to me, he said, well, I used to be perfect, and then I got married. What he means is, then all of a sudden I realized how much junk was in my trunk. I mean, I had so much going on in my life, I had no idea that I was so messed up and so selfish and that kind of thing, so proud. But when somebody is living with you, they see your activities, they ask you questions, they challenge you. All of a sudden you realize like, wow, I thought I was doing pretty good alone. But then God brings somebody else into your life and you realize like, whoa, I've really got a lot to grow in. And I'm sure that's gonna be the experience of every single person that comes together with somebody is uh, they realize like, this is tougher than I thought. And the reason of course is because God wants you to be purified. And that's why he brings other people into your life as well. So. Like I was saying, the servant had rehearsed all of what he had seen in the providence of God. It was in the ears of the entire family. He wanted to speak with everybody. The whole family on both sides should be involved with God as their foundation. Remember now, if God is not their foundation, then they should consider finding somebody who is spiritual that will be able to lead them according to God's will. And that's extremely important. And so Genesis 24, verse 29 goes on to say, And now if you will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me, let me know, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. You can see in my notes here it says, He meant business. So either this relationship would go forward or it would not. And this is a really good principle. Like, listen, if when I saw my wife, later to be my wife, if I saw her and I was just wanting to play with her and get her emotions and bring her up and try to get a little bit of this or that without really committing my life to her and the Lord, it would have been her duty to say to me, hey, back off. We're either going to do this or we're not. If you're not the one for me, then let's separate, right? That's the attitude I think we need to take because our emotions are so able to lie to us. They are so able to lead our minds in the wrong direction, imagining like, well, he did that and he did that and he did that. And, you know, that's kind of cute. But like, literally, if somebody else saw it, they'd be like, no, no, you don't want that because that's going to be a very difficult thing to work with through the rest of your life as a married partner, right? So let's be wise and understanding, knowing that either God is leading us or he is not. Okay, so make a decision now before you even wrap your emotions into somebody else's life that if God isn't leading you, then stop. Stop, turn around, and repent. Go the other direction, right? So that's what it means here when he meant business. Either this relationship would go forward or it would not. There should be no half-hearted relationships even started. 
If God is not leading, get out of that relationship. But if he is leading, prayerfully go forward with principle and determination to find God's will and by his grace it will be found. Okay, so in verse 50, the Bible says, Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceedeth from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee bad or good. We simply have to say, This is what the Lord has done. So now when God is leading, others will see it. You can know that. If he is not, they will see that as well. That's why you need other people other than just yourself and your spouse to figure out whether this is right. The Bible says there is safety in a multitude of counselors. And so Genesis 24, 51, Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go, and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord hath spoken. We can see then when God is seen in the relationship, the parents need only to submit to his leading. They should have a faith in God that he will give them the ability to see him working. That's what we're hoping for the parents in this situation. As we continue on in verse 52, it says, It came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. And so the servant, even at this point, watching and knowing that God had led, he still knew his place. It was even at this time in prayer. So the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. He gave them also to her brother and her mother precious things. And they did eat and drink, he and the men that were with him, and they tarried all night. And they rose up early in the morning and said, send me away unto my master. So now it's time. God has spoken. It is clear. Everybody's agreed. Let's do this thing. And her brother and her mother said, remember, notice like the father still isn't there, right? Let the damsel abide with us a few days, at least 10. After that, she shall go. And it says in verse 56, he said unto them, hinder me not seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. I mean, come on, we've seen his providence. Why should I wait? Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, well, okay, we're going to call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. So let's make, let's make it her decision. Let's see whether or not she wants to go now, if she feels as though she also has seen the providence of the Lord, if she feels ready, as though this is the time. Because, like, we don't want to separate anybody immaturely from their family. And so, if it's time, if everybody's ready, everybody's seen the providence, and, of course, she's ready to go and give herself to this young man named Isaac, the only begotten son of promise, then now it's time, right? So, as we continue in verse 58, they called Rebekah and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? In other words, it's her decision. And she said, I will go. So the final decision really should not be for the parents. They have a major role to play. There's no question there, but they are to allow their children to have a mind of their own in deciding the future for themselves. The parents can't make their children go to heaven. They could probably make them go to hell with influences, but every one of us need to make our decision whether we want to follow God or not. So the parents have a role, but they are not to force their children. In this case, it's very important. The mother and the brother ask the, da the daughter and the sister themselves, like, are you ready? Is it time? And so as long as God's providences are evident, the parents ought to back off and let the children make their own decision with as much guidance as possible, of course. So pray all you can, parents, before it's too late, right? In Genesis 24, 59, they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. So there was a whole crowd going together. She wasn't going to be left in the hands of some random man, Abraham's servant, that they didn't know well. They were, she was, of course, entrusted with her nurse to take care of her, and they saw there was a crowd. It was probably likely safe. In, in fact, they, they knew he was a servant of the Lord. He prayed. He made it evident with his words, etc. And so I don't think they had to worry. And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister. Be thou the mother of thousands of millions. Like, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. They're going to need a lot of diapers in that case, right? And let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. Now, thy seed, 
uh, represents the children, which all these thousands of millions, right? That's a lot of children for this dear Rebecca. But it says, thy seed, that your children, will possess the gate that they judged in the gate. You can just study that concept. And there was a lot of judgment in the gate. And let your seed be the judges of those which hate them. Okay, that's what I think is being said there. And Rebecca arose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels. That's part of why he brought the camels as well. And they followed the man. Who was the man? It was the servant that was leading this bride back to the only begotten son of promise. And the servant took Rebekah and went his way, right? So the family sent Rebekah away with both physical and spiritual blessings. That's really important because... They gave her this maid and then they sent her away with all the stuff that she had. And when God leads, he will take care of our needs and will also attend you or me, us, with blessings from our families. If in fact they are Christian as we want to be Christian. So remember, these are godly parents that were sought after for counsel. That's really important. They weren't just neglected or forgotten or forsaken. These parents were actually sought after on both sides, and they were involved, but there was a point where they had to say, listen, I've made my decision, this is going to be it. So if you are not blessed with godly parents, then by all means, seek the same type of counsel from an older person like the Ancient of Days that knows the ways of God and that knows you well also. Very important to understand. In verse 62, Isaac came from the way of the well, Lahai Roy. Now this word, Lahai Roy, means, it actually means the well of the living one. So what's in a well? It's the water of life. So Isaac, what was he doing? He was spending time drinking the water of life, for he dwelt in the south country. And Isaac came out to meditate in the field at eventide. So not only was he drinking of the water of life, he was also meditating upon the law of God, as it says there in Psalm chapter 1. So he went out to meditate in the field, in nature, by the way, not in the city, but in nature, and at eventide. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels that were coming. And so notice carefully this point. Isaac was not actively pursuing a mate or a spouse for himself. He was out having evening devotions, very important. He went out to meditate in nature, like I said in Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. He was blessed. He was a young man, and this is for young men. A good Christian lady will not be looking for guys that are cool, okay? They are looking for spiritual giants. That's who a true Christian woman is looking for. Young men too often spend their time trying to impress ladies with all their worldly hype and accomplishments, yet... They fail miserably in building their character, which will be to their spouse by far the greatest blessing. And so you must surrender yourself to God, both a male or a female, in preparation for being connected with your spouse. And that is the best preparation you could possibly get. Of course, men should be working as we saw Adam had a job before he was married, etc. But when you draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you, it says in the book of James chapter 4. So this man, he wanted, which was Isaac, the only begotten son of promise, he wanted to be a powerful spiritual leader, representing Christ, of course, as this story does. Again, this is what godly women are looking for. Divine Revelation tells us that we ought to be diligent in prayer about the relationships we find ourselves in. God must lead. His hand must be seen working by all involved. The Lord wishes to give us blessings far beyond what we can even ask or think or imagine. If we would trust in Him, even in something as delicate as the relationship in our life, He will bless you with comfort, and He did as He did with Isaac and Rebecca. There was a time I was pastoring, and there was a male and a female that were coming together, and the, the me, female had some questions about the male's spiritual life. And so she asked me as the pastor, like, what do I do? I said, well, let me chat with him for a while. I called him up and I asked him, and these were adult male and female. They, they both had professions. They were in their own homes. They had their own cars and they were living their lives, right? So they wanted to come together. But 
I asked him, I said, so tell me about your spiritual life. You know, you're preparing for this uh, service of marriage. And I'm just wondering, like, what is it with you? How, how are you going in your spiritual daily life? He says, well, I pray and I read. Yeah. I said, how much time do you spend in prayer about this relationship that you're in? And he says, oh, <laughs> I don't pray about the, this relationship. This is my business. I mean, God's not involved in hooking me up with this, this female. I was like on the phone thinking, what? Are you serious? And so he had a misunderstanding of God's involvement in his relationship. And so she had a very good eye in that situation. And I would encourage every one of us to be very diligent in looking for what matters the most. Is this person I'm interested in going to be serving the Lord forever? If they are, they're going to want to serve me too. And if we each mutually serve one another, we are going to love each other until we are taken by the only begotten Son of Promise up to, of course, the kingdom of heaven. So in verse 64, we're almost done here. Rebecca lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. Take heed to the simplicity in the preparation of this wedding. Amen. So verse 66, And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. Now so the servant, after he went through all the providence, he told Isaac everything, all things that he had done. Isaac now had to be informed as to what the Lord had been doing, right? So he was fully aware in this verse of the providence that had been leading the servant to his bride. His decision was to be the final word in this matter. The female has already seen God's providence. She hasn't even met this man yet, but she knows what God has been doing. Finally, it is his decision. His is the final decision, which represents Christ, the only begotten of the, of the Father, right? The only begotten Son of Promise. His decision was to be the final word in this matter. He had to see what everyone else saw as though it were the providence of God, or there would be no marriage. He was already out in the field asking for God's blessings and direction. And if he came in and heard some crazy story about how some woman was this and that, and all of a sudden here she is with, you know... You know improper clothing, etc., he would have said, no, thank you, if he were a spiritual giant, which, of course, he was. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, come on. This is part of the family line of God, right? So, having learned all of God's works, he was satisfied. He knew the master's working because he had been spending so much time with the master in the field just a few, you know, yards back, right? So, you may ask, how will I know which person is for me? Well, the answer is found in knowing the God of Abraham. If you know the God of Abraham, that same God that directed Isaac and Rebekah together through all those providences will do it for you as well. Do not trust to anybody else other than God in this situation. And you can see how he's leading by lots of prayer and lots of study. So if you know this God, the God of Abraham personally, he will make a move or when he makes a move, you will know it, right? In verse 67, Isaac brought her into her mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah and she became his wife and he loved her and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. And so as they rode off into the sunset on Camelback, the story ends so beautifully. This will be the continuing experience of those that are willing to seek God's counsel in finding a spouse for their lives. There will be love and comfort for all those who are willing to do the Master's will. May each of us have the blessings that Isaac and Rebecca were praying for and what they experienced. So this story is more than what appears on the surface. God illustrated this, this huge picture of his gospel right here in this simple story of just, just over 60 verses. And so what we see here is God illustrates this experience of Abraham representing the father, the ancient of days. Isaac representing the son, the servant representing the ministry of the Holy Spirit, while Rebekah represented the church. And so our heavenly father has sent forth his spirit, the spirit of his son, 
which you can see in Galatians chapter 4 verse 6 and how it was done in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14. It was to prepare a virgin daughter for his son. As the spirit representative went out to meet the daughter, he brought her home to the son. And there will be a beautiful wedding that will last for all eternity when we as the bride are prepared by the Spirit and the Spirit's ministry. And so Jesus is coming soon for his bride. Will you be ready for that glorious day? Will you be ready with your spouse, holding the hands of eternity together, saying, yes, I've made a covenant under God with this person, and I'm going to be faithful to this person as I am faithful to God. If your covenant to that person is like that, you will be satisfied in your relationship, and it will be a blessing. And so, like I said, for more than uh, 19 years, God has blessed me with the opportunity of being married. But I'll tell you a little bit of our experience. When I met her, she met me, we both knew immediately that we were Christian and we both wanted to serve the Lord in missions. That was clear to both of us. We met actually at a missionary college. And it was at that time I was able to meet the family. And the, of course, the father and the mother were very curious about who this young person is that's interested in their daughter. And, you know, there was the meeting that the father had with me. He actually asked me, interestingly, he asked me how much money I had in my account. And it was kind of like the dowry question. How much money do you have in your account? And I was eating together with him at this time because he had taken me out to a meal. And uh, so I told him. And uh, being hired as a pastor full-time at, at that time, I actually was able to have some money in my account, for which I was thankful. And so we decided to have a time, uh, we set a time for our service. And the parents wisely asked us to postpone that and to get marital counseling. And so we went through marital counseling, having listened to the uh, godly parents of my, my own, but also my, uh, my wife, and we postponed the marriage or the wedding service and then we took counsel from both a pastor and also a counselor i at the time having good insurance as a pastor in the adventist church i was able to use that insurance to be able to get the counseling for just uh, you know not not very much money so the lord blessed in that situation we were able to interact with as many people as we could knowing and, and talking about the providences we had seen and how god was leading asking all the questions and answering all the questions from the parents of my wife, going to my parent as well. My father at that time, he was not Christian, but of course I respected his thoughts. But my mother, she was Christian and so I was interacting with her. And after a time we were able to have a wedding service and since then, like I said, it's been incredible. We've been together for 19 years. It has been tough on occasions, but for the most part it's been a great blessing. And God has saw, seen us through and I believe that we will grow old together, if not here on this earth, then in eternity. We're going to be together and be blessed. So I'm hoping that this message was something that was encouraging for you and that will be good biblical foundation for you to be able to build upon as you are looking for that person who should be a great encouragement to your ministry in, this, in the, the world here by the Lord's direction instead of a, a deterrent from his will for your life. So. May God bless you and keep you as we continue to seek together the will of God in preparation for the coming of the only begotten Son of promise. God bless you.